Now this is a story all about how the web got made and added its style. It's no great revelation, but I'll say it. The web is a big part of our lives, but it's now starting to reach the point where it has history and can be appreciated with wider context. There are teenagers alive now, younger than the first iPhone. Adults who have no memory of life before the internet. New learners of HTML and CSS might commonly ask, why is it this way? As if those languages arrived fully formed with web technology on day one. The truth is a bit stranger. How did we get here? How did we get the language responsible for every beautiful web experience ever made? This is the story all about how CSS was made. We'll begin, I think, best with the beginning. In the beginning there was nothing, and Tim Berners-Lee said, let there be light, and he saw it was kind of good. From the vantage point of our immensely complex web, it doesn't seem that impressive to send a document electronically, but it was, of course, groundbreaking, so much so that nobody considered it very important to add settings about how the document would be styled or customized. I mean, isn't this enough? But of course not, and this was a people-led revolution. The Berlin Wall has fallen. A world is united. It has a new medium to bring us closer together. The hobbyists want to push this forward, with no central ownership or dominance by a few large companies. The web should allow expression, creativity, and above all, freedom. It's 1993. Whitney Houston will always love you. Jurassic Park is a hot new film and there's some 10,000 websites. What do these sites look like? Well, the Mosaic browser lets you change the font color. Mark Andreessen, one of the Mosaic programmers, is famed for his quote when asked about adding styles to a web page. He'd simply reply, sorry, you screwed. Of course, this was a known oversight, and Mark went on to become co-founder of Netscape with an aim to fix this obvious problem. There was one central issue. This tech was so new that there was no one solid idea about how styling should be done in web, or even a group to make a decision on it. Discussions began among web users, government, business, educational institutions about standards for HTML, leading to Tim Berners-Lee creating the World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C, in 1994. There were actually a few different proposals as to how styles should be handled on the web, and it's hard to relate to their challenges because we all live in the future. Look. If you're just trying to let people change font sizes and colors for a very slow loading document, why would we need a whole new language? It's with great hindsight and gratitude we should credit those who foresaw the benefits of taking styles out of HTML. Wait, you mentioned varying proposals? What were they? Let's meet them. There was Robert Raish's RRP, which was minimal, sleek, and confusing. PWP, which is credited with the introducing the idea of external style sheets. Fozy, used a sort of HTML format and introduced the M sizing unit. There was DSSSL, which looked kind of awesome. It allowed uh, functions and calculations that would have solved a lot of devs' problems, but it might have been a bit too cumbersome. PSL was a sort of souped up CSS with document awareness and logical statements, but it just wasn't mainstream enough. CHSS, Cascading HTML Style Sheets, was first proposed by Hakon W. Lee, and spoiler alert, it was the winning proposal, and here's why. It was important that a page could start loading at the top of the document while still passing the rest. Any advanced proposal which involved reading the whole document and making style settings wouldn't allow that, so CSS had a low-level approach that suited the needs of the time. It's one of the reasons we still don't have parent selectors as useful as they'd be. It was simple, very readable and accessible. CSS was perceived by some as being too simple for the task it was designed for, which was good as no one was keen to learn a whole new language. The cascade allowed multiple style sheets to be attached to a document, which was a benefit to browsers, authors, and its users. 
In fact, the original idea was that CSS settings had a percentage value to decide what proportion of that setting should be applied between the style sheets, and users could sort of adapt their control over the page. It sounds weird now, but from the perspective of mainly text documents with no layout issues, it makes more sense than the whole specificity thing we do now. Following a couple of years of refinement and positive feedback within the web community, Hakon Lee and Bert Boss published the first version of the CSS spec in December 1996. They dropped the H with the idea CSS could be used in other languages, and Boss and Lee released their book Cascading Style Sheets in 1997, which set out how to actually use this thing. Not that it was possible in any browsers yet. What was in CSS1? Font size, color, margin, padding, and everyone's favorite, the important. Still in everyday use today. The first official recommendation was adopted by Netscape Navigator and Internet Explorer 4, the dominant browsers at the time, but that really oversimplifies the level of completion. In 1997, a group led by Chris Lilly, not that one, set about fixing issues in CSS with a proposal for CSS2, which arrived the following year. Unlike most sequels, it delivered on the hype. We got stuff like Z-index, bidirectional text, absolute relative fixed positioning, and new font properties such as shadows. And that's going to have to do it for now. Seriously, CSS 2.1 is 14 years away at this point. Having a CSS launch party is great, except if no browsers show up, then there's nothing to celebrate. The big two at this time were IE and Netscape, which both supported a few CSS features, just not the same ones. Making a web page that worked in both required different style sheets for each, or a lot of hacks, or just give up on CSS altogether. Their competition for dominance didn't even help. They implemented their own solutions to their own standards in whatever timeline. Netscape even came up with JSSS, JavaScript style sheets, allowing devs to add CSS to their page with JavaScript. We should point out this was chippy, naive young JavaScript, not grizzled master who'd go on to eat the whole dev stack. It was unfavored and gradually fell out of favor though. I mean, can you imagine something so silly as CSS written in JavaScript? In 1998, the Web Standards Project, somehow shortened to WASP, was founded. George Olson, Glenn Davis, and Jeffrey Zeldman began to hold browsers to account about their web standards and support for, among other things, CSS1. As years progressed, highlighting browser features saw gradual improvements Whilst newcomers like Opera and Mozilla knew what was expected of them, there were projects like Todd Farmer's Acid Test in 1998, which was a nice little test drive for your browser features. Doc types were added, allowing developers to specify which CSS spec they supported and clarify their box model. A collective will to make this happen saw standards improve, and CSS gained prominence as the industry standard way to style web pages. CSS had survived its shaky launch, but cross-browser issues would still haunt it. Many developers' lifelong hate for CSS was likely fostered in this era. CSS was barely usable until 1997, and it was not until March of 2000 that a browser fully supported CSS1. Which, by the way, was IE 5.5 for Mac. It's a fun little bit of trivia. For CSS to survive, it still needed wider adoption and ease of use, and there were many more roadblocks and challenges ahead. In the next part of this series, we look at CSS layouts and design tools the rise of Flash, and stop by the Zen Garden, as CSS enters the start of the new millennium.